What else we got in here? Warren, Mensinger, Tracy and Misty. There's Wayne and Brenda. And there's a church building. Okay, that's neat. I don't know where that is, so we're okay. Oh, there's Pam and Kevin. What else we got in here? Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Right. Mary and Terry Cole. There's Terry and Ray. Caitlin, Brian, Michelle Hodge. That was an older picture. I think the missing one. Usually when we start talking and the first thing we think of when we hear the word share is we do the church share. And the church share is this. It's always where the preacher gets up there and he says, you need to give more time to God, right? Right? You always hear this. It's like, you don't give enough time to God or, you know, if you can give a little more money, right? Everybody's favorite sermon of all. Or, you know, if you shared your stuff, right? And the thing is, too often we get in this concept of sharing, and, and it instantly goes to church share. You know, do those things, dedicate your life, you're not using your talents, blah, 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 preachers last forever when they talk. But, one thing we rarely talk about is actually just sharing the love. And by that I mean something that I was just looking at was looking at pictures. How many of y'all just... Ever just hang out in the little foyer area there? You know there's a foyer, right? Can you walk through it? And I just noticed that we have these huge boxes. We have them hidden in that and that and that. And we have these pictures everywhere stuff. And today I want to talk to you about something that's much more closely to sharing pictures. Because I know most of us, you know, we get holidays and stuff, and we sit around and we look at pictures, and we're like, we reminisce and go, how great that was. But we don't do it as Christians. We don't do it as much as we need to do it as Christians. So we are in 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. The, the sharing I want to talk to you about today is not as hard or as difficult as saying, you know, give more time, give more money, give more of your stuff, be more into God. But it's also more time consuming. What I'm talking about is when you have a conversation, is that conversation a sharing in the suffering? A sharing in the comfort? Because we have this habit, right? A, a Jewish greeting would consist of way too long. Jesus said, don't even greet people. It takes too long. He said, go and preach the message, don't even greet people. And to us, we're like, why couldn't you say hi? No. You couldn't ask about their family and their extended family and their grandkids and their great grandkids <laughs> and every person who might still be alive. But he offers us something different and asks us more about sharing. <clears throat> but this is how our conversations exist. Our conversations go, how are you doing? I'm good. It is the only answer I'm allowed to say. I could say pretty good or excellent, but I can never go in the opposite direction. You can't go, well, I'm not having that good a day. I can't believe you said that. You have three words to say. It's all you have to do. I'm good. I am good. Just make sure those three. And what we're talking about today is, have you ever noticed how much the Bible is wasted? Normally when I preach, I usually skip the first chapter of a lot of books. Whoops. I gave away something. 
And the reason I do is because there's not this deep, he doesn't just start off, run at you full bore and go, let's start talking about Jesus and just run you over. He says, well, you know, we've got to share. I'm thinking about coming to visit you. You know, and when I say I'm coming to visit you, it's not that I'm saying yes or no. It's yes, if the Lord wills, I'm coming to visit you. And we're sitting there going, well, what do we care if Paul's visiting some people 2,000 years ago? But if God considers it worthy to waste, and I want you to see the irony in that word, waste, Scripture, with something as frivolous, meaningless, as sharing, communicating, talking about our love for one another, and being there for one another, maybe it's worthwhile. Maybe it's something we should spend a little more time and go, well, there's five acts of worship, and then there's this six that's called loving your brother. I think I can make up acts of worship, right? Somebody did. But here's the thing. What if you made up a six thing and you said it was just as important? You said it is just as important that we share our lives with one another. <clears throat> as anything else we do, it is just as important <clears throat> that we love one another. Verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware of, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You also join in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. The second idea behind this not sharing concept, we have a second effect. We never pray for it. If I walk up to you and I say, how are you doing? And you say, good, I'm not going to pray for that. Well, they said good. I hope the Lord will fix that situation in their life. I hope they're having a miserable day next week. No, and what happens is we don't do that thing that Paul wastes so much time on and it's just sharing himself and saying, you know what, we've been through a lot of affliction. We appreciate that you've joined with us in praying for us. We appreciate that you've been in with us and taken part on this and we have had favor because of what you've done. And our lack of sharing causes this problem. Too often something can be, go be going terrible wrong in our lives. And we're so stuck in what is the proper way to talk to somebody. That we're not like, hey, it's going terrible. How are you doing today? Well, terrible. I woke up on the wrong side and everything went wrong after that. But he continues with this. And it's all about sharing. Starting in verse 12. For our proud confidence is this. The testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, and I hope you will understand until the end. Just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you are also ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Verse 15, in this confidence I intended at first to come to you, so you might twice receive a blessing. That is to pass your way to Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you. And by you to be helped in my journey to Judea. Therefore I was not facilitating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I propose, do I propose according to the flesh? So that with me there will be yes, yes, and no, no at the same time. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus who was preached among you by us, by me and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but it's yes in him. For as many as are promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen. To the glory of God through us. 
Now he who established us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our heart as a pledge. But I call God as witness to my soul that despaired you. I did not come again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but our workers with you for your joy. For in your faith you are standing firm. Were you thinking the same thing I was? I was really going back to my first thought of going, how in the world does anybody preach on something that, I don't know, it was 2,000 years ago, some guy didn't make a trip, he didn't show up on time, okay. <coughs> I mean, it's not like 2,000 years from now somebody's going to go, yeah, did you notice he was running late that day? Did you notice he didn't make it on his trip that day? No. And the truth is, too often we look at Scripture and we want it to be just so bold in your face and just beat you down or just so uplifting and so excellent. And the reality is, the Bible's real. It's not this mythical story where, oh, I've got a cute story to learn a moral lesson. It's this, hey, guess what? I was going to come to you, but then God sent me another way and I didn't get to. I was really hoping to see you twice. Because the Bible doesn't tell us what to do, it shows us what to do. Paul doesn't say, okay, let me tell you exactly how you should be behaving. He says, this is how I'm behaving. And we refer back to when he said, the imitators of me, as I imitate Christ. But too often, if I ask you what is the most important part of service, I'm going to get one of five things. Communion. It's a big one. Very big one. Singing. It's a big one. Very big one. Praying. It's, it's a big one. Very big one. Preaching. You know, lesser ones. Um, giving. Come on, can we avoid that one today? <coughs> but you understand what I'm saying? When we talk about those things, when we talk about serving God, we're going to go back to those five things and say they're very important. And when, when I say, yeah, you know when sends out their greeting people. That's really important and everybody goes, oh. Yeah, you know, when you come in the door and Sid's got that face and he's looking at you and you're like, Sid, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing that. I'm so glad because without that, I'd miss one of the pieces of coming here. I know other people greet at the door, trust me. But something about the fact that we ignore that so much and we go, Let's talk about time or money or stuff and not talk about just sharing. Because the, the odds are that you're going to talk to somebody today. Unless something goes terribly wrong, you will talk to somebody today. And here's the question. When you're talking to them, will you take a lesson from Paul and start talking about your hope? Talk about your affliction. Talk about real stuff and share real love and say, you know what? We're really struggling. We, we've been tempted in a way that God is putting us through a test so that we can't trust in ourselves. And, and if there's ever a plea from Paul going, guys, I just can't do it. I need y'all. I need y'all to support me in prayer. I need y'all to lift me up. I need this because God is trying to teach me I can't trust myself. And all of us have done that our whole lives. And when you're having that conversation, are you honestly going to be saying, I'm willing to share that love? I'm willing to talk and be real with people and say, you know, I, I'm really excited what God's doing in my life. I, I don't know how unusual it is for you, but I know how unusual it is for me. And you're supposed to talk weird to me anyway. You're supposed to come up to the preacher and use words that I don't understand because somebody wrote them in the King James and you expect me to read it. I got it. You're supposed to say, thou is the right. I'm just like, I don't remember. You're supposed to. And I don't even get this. Do you know God's really doing something awesome in my life? I mean, you have to use King James English, but I don't get that. And so I don't know if you don't experience the same thing, and I assume you don't. But whenever we look at somebody else and we say, we don't experience it, we need to look back at ourselves and say, well, am I giving it out? When I'm talking to somebody, am I telling them how much either I need God or how much God's doing in my life? Because preaching at people is effective if they're ready and God has already prepared their hearts 
And God has used those conversations that you're going to have with people where you're just sharing what God is doing. And then at that point, the message is effective because God has already prepared them. And that preparing is just as important. Wasting the first chapter in 2 Corinthians is important. Wasting it is important because it's those conversations that can then be followed up with a message of truth. Because the number one thing that youth complain about in youth ministry is this. People aren't real. What? They, they go in there and teach them and they tell them how they're perfect and how they've always done everything right and make up all, all kinds of other lies. But it's the same with all people. All people want something real, something authentic. And when we're talking about love, too often we're like, well, I'll give you this time, but you know I want it. You know, I don't really want to give it to you. And when talk, Paul talks about this, he doesn't want our worship to be confined to some formalized setting that has to be condoned by the elders and designed on a certain set time. And everyone must assemble and all five acts must be present. And I read the list to try to figure out what worship was the other day. I looked it up. I said, Church of Christ, worship. And I, I went through the list and I tried to memorize everything that must be present to have worship. I forgot most of it. But how sad is it that our worship is confined to something that needs a list that I can't even memorize? And instead looks at it and says, you know what my worship is? My worship is when I'm, I'm going to go to the store in a little bit, and I'm going to meet somebody, and I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to be like, God is doing a lot in my life. Hey, that was good worship, wasn't it? Hey, I, my mom's going to call me, or son, or daughter, or whoever calls you. And you're going to talk to them, and you're going to be like, can you pray for me? Uh, you know, I, I'm really struggling to draw closer to God. I'm really struggling with God right now. And then come back and say, that was really good worship. Because if we think worship occurs in this hour-long segment, <coughs> then Paul wasted a lot of time. <coughs> Paul wasted a ton of time. He is writing the very word of God and he wastes our time with his stupid stuff about him going over here or not going over here. Who cares if you go to Macedonia? I don't even know where Macedonia is. I live in America, in West Virginia. Did you mention it? No? Nope. Okay, don't care. He is wasting our time in the word of God if worship is confined to a bunch of rules and set and it's got to be right here in this box. Because I've read the Bible, and guess what? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Because there are passages that John 1 starts out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. And not anything that was made was not made through Him. And I'm like, that's beautiful, God. And then Paul starts off with, I'm going to Macedonia. Oh, not going to make it. And we have to rethink how we view God and rethink how we treat worship and serving God and go, it's not just about those minutes. Then we go, that's extremely holy time. If I'm sitting there drinking a Coke, drinking Coke, with my buddy, and we're talking about how God is working in our lives or how I'm struggling to serve God, well, that's the same stuff Paul thinks is worthy of Scripture. And if God considers it worthy to go in His work, Maybe we should be a little more considerate of it. Titus 3. Verses 4 through 7. <coughs> Sorry. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us 
not on the basis of deeds which be done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be being heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that today the lesson has been more of a challenge than anything. Take those conversations. Take those times that we don't consider holy or special or set apart to God and use them. Share love when you're not supposed to. It's not required. Share love when you just have a conversation. So that in hearing the word, faith can be produced. A belief in Christ. And through understanding that we suffer, they can then understand we are all sinful. I mean, I look at this person, they are sinful too. And then in, in seeing us proclaim Christ, they can then go, I proclaim Christ too. And hearing them speak of the joys of serving God, they can then respond with baptism. And then seeing us live out our lives, they then can be pushed to live out their lives for God. There's someone who has not responded to God's message through us. God's message through His Word. If there's anybody who needs prayers because there's something and saying, I'm good, is not good enough. Or if there's anybody who wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.